Hancock and Bovell sum it up nicely in The Keeper of Genesis. The Weta ring patterns, which have been studied by geologists from Boston University, have been identified as having been caused by prolonged exposure to heavy rains. In 2500 BC when Egyptologists presumed that the Sphinx was built, Egypt was as bone dry as it is today. Between 15,000 and 7,000 BC, however, the science of paleoclimatology indicates that Egypt several times passed through periods of wet climate which could have caused weathering patterns such as these. The trench surrounding the Great Sphinx which was created at the same time that the Sphinx was carved, very clearly indicates the rolling scalloped coves and very deep vertical fissures characteristic of precipitation-induced weathering in limestone figure 82. The sciences of geology and paleoclimatology alone, however, can only demonstrate that the Sphinx and its enclosure are much older than previously thought. Archaeoastronomical analysis provides a far more accurate tool for dating the Sphinx. The work done by West and Shaw clearly demonstrates beyond any doubt that the massive amount of erosion visible on the Sphinx was indeed caused by water. The somewhat controversial issue of the Sphinx bearing signs of water erosion was actually first raised by a French Egyptologist named Schlauer de Lubies, whose theory was considered to be much too contentious at the time and was also hurriedly dismissed. The academic community chooses to completely disregard this indisputable evidence of water erosion because it poses an enormous problem for them. It's universally agreed that Egypt has been subject to severe flooding in the past but geological studies of the area show that the last time there were any rains or floods in Egypt, of a magnitude to cause the type of erosion that can be found on the Sphinx, was between 7,000 and 15,000 years ago and that just doesn't help their cause at all because it actually proves their theory to be irrefutably erroneous. Now just think about all that for a moment. These types of standard geological tests are used to date the last flood in the area and hundreds of other sites around the world and the results are accepted. Yet when exactly the same tests are used and they irrefutably prove the erosion on the Sphinx and its enclosure was very clearly created by water, but the results are dismissed and the entire debate on the issue is not mentioned to the public. Did you see that? In the blink of an eye and quick bit of scientific sleight of hand, one set of standard geological tests is to be accepted while another set of identical tests is to be disregarded. Simply because it's not an issue when the last torrential rains occurred in Egypt, but it is an issue to say the Sphinx may have been there at the time because if it was there it would prove them wrong, so they simply disallow the test. And if someone does one behind their back, well then the test is disregarded and if they complain, it's back to the doctor and waiting and personal attacks as the last line of defense. And let's face it folks, it's really the only defense they have. The fact that no such erosion is visible anywhere on the pyramids is also a serious issue for contention because that means that the Sphinx may have even been there before the Great Pyramid, in fact well before it. This is also an arena that Egyptologists view as very dangerous ground and flatly refuse to enter into. Any attempt to raise the issue invariably produces a wave of scathing and usually very personal and unscientific attacks punctuated by numerous brandishing of degrees. Of course one must remember that the pyramids were all encased with smooth, weathered and much hardened limestone and that this may well have served for protection of the three monuments during any great rains or floods thus preventing any visible signs of water erosion while the Sphinx would have been left exposed to any damaging flood waters however, according to West and others. The entire Giza complex can be accurately dated by simply studying the astronomical alignments of the various monuments. The reason astronomy can so easily be used for this task is because astronomy, ritual and reincarnation were such very important parts of the Egyptian belief system and many believe the basis of the entire ancient Egyptian culture. The Egyptians believed heavily in the duality between heaven and earth and they considered the kingdom of the god Osiris to be a very specific place in the heavens. This duality and the nature of the do of itself are very well explained in a book entitled Initiation by Elizabeth Hayach. In the book Hayach aptly explains the Egyptian reincarnation beliefs which included the various levels of discipline that must be attained in order to reach the ship flash house flash place flash planet of millions of years. Hayach believes that the pyramid featured very significantly in this process and that the king's chamber was actually an initiation chamber. She says that the initiate who had attained high enough level of enlightenment could lie in the actual sarcophagus and be able to meditate through all of their incarnations without the need of living them enabling them to then reach their final incarnation with the gods who reside within the do of
Hyach claims that the shape of the pyramid and the unusual placement of the blocks within the ceiling of the king's chamber are designed in such a way that certain cosmic energies are channeled through the stonework and concentrated at one end of the sarcophagus. The center of this concentrated energy lies precisely where a person's pineal gland would be if they were laying in the enclosure. The pineal gland lies at the front center section of the brain between the frontal lobes, kind of between and behind the eyes, and seems to serve no real biological function. The gland is also known as the third eye, in Eastern cultures and is believed to be our highest spiritual receptor when awakened. It is also often referred to as the impaired eye. Such a theory is not entirely without interest as unusual concentrations of energies within the king's chamber have actually been reported by various people and it is quite strange for the roof of the chamber to have been constructed in such a fashion figure 83 as it serves no purpose in regards to strengthening the structure and seems like it would have been an awful lot of trouble to build. The cavities were hidden within the structure until they were found during excavation in search of treasures. It is thought that the ancient Egyptians believed the Duat to be a place where man could live in immortality with the gods and that the soul of a man could reach this place through knowledge and ritual. Many believe that they also believe that the Duat was a specific place in the sky, namely the stars of Sirius and Orion's belt. Hancock and Bovell believe the Giza structures were built as an earthly representation of the Duat and placed in a way that would intentionally mirror the Duat on the earth at the time of construction. As is known to us and was also known to the ancient Egyptians, due to axial wobble, the Earth experiences a gradual movement of the stars across the skies. This gradual movement is called the precession of the equinoxes and is what gives us the changing signs of the zodiac. This precession can be calculated by marking the slow rotation of the stars against the vernal equinox. It takes 2160 years for one house of the zodiac to move completely past the vernal point. An entire precession through all the signs of the zodiac takes 29,920 years to complete. Hancock and Bovell used a computer model to simulate this axial wobble and determine exactly when the Giza complex would represent an accurate depiction of the dew of Earth. In the Keeper of Genesis they had this to say. What is required in order to achieve the ideal ground sky arrangement, is somehow to rotate the heavens in an anti-clockwise direction. The vast engine of the Earth's axial wobble offers us a mechanism by which this can be done. We need only instruct our computer to track the precessionally induced movements of the stars backwards in time. As it does so, millennium by millennium, we observe that the orientation of Orion's belt at culmination is slowly rotating anti-clockwise and thus approaching ever closer to our desired meridian to meridian match. It is not until 10,000 BC however, 8,000 years before the pyramid age that the perfect correlation is finally achieved with the Nile mirroring the Milky Way and the three pyramids and the three belt identically disposed to the same meridian it is only in this epoch that we can find a perfect ground to sky correlation and it is also the only time when the Sphinx would have gazed at his own celestial counterpart of Leo as it rose on the vernal point. Hancock and Bovell go on to say there is a feature of this 10,500 BC correlation which suggests strongly that coincidence is not involved. The pattern that is frozen into monumental architecture in the form of the pyramids marks a very significant moment in the 25,920-year procession cycle of the three stars of Orion's belt, one that is unlikely to have been selected at random by the pyramid builders. The question reduces to this. Is it a coincidence? that the Giza Necropolis as it has reached us today out of the darkness of antiquity, is still dominated by a huge equinoctial lion statue at the east of its horizon and by three gigantic pyramids disposed about its meridian in the distinctive manner of the three stars of Orion's belt in 10,500 BC. And is it also coincidence that the monuments in this amazing astronomical theme park manage to work together, almost as though geared, like the coax wheels of a clock, to tell the same time? When this information was coupled with the west and shock water erosion evidence, the picture was complete for them. But when west and shock completed testing their theory and first excitedly announced the results of their investigations to the world, the outcry was almost deafening and the barrage of criticism overwhelming. Egypt's top archaeologist drive. Zaki Hadas and another renowned Egyptologist drive. Mark Lenner.
who is considered the world foremost authority on the Sphinx were quick to launch scathing personal attacks on the pair and publicly discredited the theory as much as possible. Drive Lenner even went so far as to accuse West and Shock of being ignorant and insensitive. Now just think about that for a moment, science, insensitive. It is a somewhat unusual remark to come from a scientist don't you think? His sole intent was to remove the issue from the scientific arena and place it on a more personal playing field. As usual in many such cases it was a public display of the most unscientific attitude that completely failed to address any of the evidence that was being presented. The whole affair was similar to a schoolboy who had a drawing criticized by one of his peers rather than a scientist debating evidence, for heaven's sake, insensitive. Get some sort of a scientific grip. These personal attacks we are now seeing so frequently are actually a highly political strategy that has recently been adopted by academia and are fast becoming the standard final move. The method is often employed by cunning politicians when losing an argument. If an issue becomes too obvious to argue against, the best tactic is to discredit anyone who dares to call that which is accepted into question thereby shifting the tension away from the actual issue and turning it into a more personalized attack against the presenter. It's the emperor's new clothes syndrome in the case of the Giza complex, rather than having to argue a case they are aware they could not possibly win, Hadass and Lenner again simply invoked the demeanor of untouchable authority that is presumed by their positions in the academic hierarchy. It should be mentioned here that Anthony West himself actually holds no credentials, being a self-taught archaeologist and so is not part of the club so to speak. Though even with this being the case, his research on the Sphinx was nothing short of excellent and his findings were backed up by a considerable amount of scientific, geological and astronomical data. It probably should also be pointed out that Albert Einstein was just a patent clerk when he destroyed many of Newton's theories. Back then, intelligence was intelligence. Things are not quite that simple now. Shortly after the theory was put forth, the American Association for the Advancement of Science invited a debate on the issue. But only Leonard and Shock were allowed to participate while West, who held most of the evidence, was not, due to his lack of credentials. As was discussed in Chapter 1, this is another method the academic community constantly employs to keep credible new information and theories out of the public information loop. Academia decrees that only people with degrees and doctorates are permitted to practice science and they have two very important and quite simple filters in place to ensure that independent research is suppressed. One credentials and two peer review because no matter what your evidence or theories are nothing gets past peer review but you cannot receive peer review without first having credentials but of course in order to get credentials you need to toe the party line and embrace the accepted theories for you simply won't get your degree in the first place so what do you do remember catch 22 that's actually quite brilliant in its simplicity in some scary way Again this is a ridiculous and extraordinarily unscientific approach to science because science is something that anyone can study and learn. All that is needed is for one to possess a keen and analytical mind. The person does not need a degree to educate oneself or record facts, or to conduct experiments, observe their outcomes and think about them in a critical way. In a truly free and open society where the pursuit of true knowledge is nurtured, science, by its very basic fabric, needs to be part of the free democratic process and all theories examined. Science was never designed to be an elitist club presided over by closed minds. Such behavior is truly irresponsible and can only ever serve as a hindrance to legitimate research and the genuine pursuit of real truths. Science cannot properly function as an authoritarian regime, 